everybody and welcome to this the first of the wfa better marketing podcasts um i'm david weldon ex-president of the wfa ex-cmo of rbs and generally ex of everything and i am therefore enjoying um covid that's a strange thing to say through the lens of slow living and i've had the time to think about things talk about things today we're going to touch on one of the most important subjects that's bubbled to the surface is of course diversity and inclusion and i'm joined by two wonderful uh, ambassadors from the wfa welcome belinda smith from new york and welcome jerry dakin from somewhere in london i don't know where in london but um, let's start with the most important question belinda how are you how, how have you been coping I, I mean i know you've been doing a bit of homeschooling not yourself but how are things oh no i've been homeschooling myself also <laughs> let's, let's make that very clear i think it's probably been a roller coaster everywhere but we went um from being the the one of the first and hardest hit COVID markets, and um, you know, if there's one thing that's eerie about New York, it's about New York being quiet and there not being cars and people on the street. So that was a little strange. We had George Floyd and protest, and um, you know, our local police force has always been problematic, but definitely in these times as well. So. Um, I, I, I've actually, though, enjoyed my neighborhood a lot. I think in this moment, we've seen a lot of community organizing. Um, we've seen a lot of um, people getting really involved and interested politically with our school systems, with how our neighborhoods are kept up. Um, and uh, from that perspective, I've been having a really wonderful time. So um, not all bad news over here. It's been a weird year, but, but it's been good. Yeah, but it is so great to see you and welcome. And Jerry, how about you? How have you been coping? I've I've been doing okay. I mean, I'm uh, in a lucky situation where my you know my my job has kept me very busy. I haven't had any issues on that front. In fact, I, I work for for GSK for a, for a healthcare company, so it's obviously been an unprecedentedly busy year for us. Um, certainly, there've been there've been challenges. Um, I think I've I've gone a bit mad of of my office, even though I've um, put up new pictures and, and changed the background as often as I can. And even then, I know I'm I'm lucky to have a space like this. I know many of my my team don't have their own office or don't have their own room to to be able to work, and and that's been a, been a real challenge. I think. And I think you know the, the boundaries of when work ends and home begins have have been blurred. Um, so I haven't haven't loved that, but I, I have loved a, a lot of things. I have, as Belinda was saying, I've enjoyed getting to know my local area a bit better. I only moved here a couple of years ago, and it's been nice to to shop and act a bit local. And actually, it's a a nice balance. Um, but yeah, like like most of us, I I, I certainly long for a return to a, a better balance where we where we we can do some of the old things as as well as some of the new habits we've we've built. Uh, nice to hear the common theme there of return to community and um, you know I spot that around here as well. But Linda, turning to something more serious, I mean you mentioned already the horrific killing of George Floyd and, and you know what I'm really interested in is your perspective on how the world of marketing and advertising has responded. Uh, you know has the world of Black Lives Matter made an impact? Have you seen companies doing things differently? Yeah, the, I mean this is a this is a tough question. I think it's just, it's yes and no. Uh, the world of brands and marketing have responded in a huge way. We've had a lot of tweets. We've had a lot of Instagram posts. We've had some press releases, um, even some good panels. Um, and, and then in other places, you know, we, we've seen a lot of, of weird silence, I think. And I think for me, one thing that's been hard working remote is just feeling so isolated and feeling like it's hard to get an answer and it's hard to understand what's happening outside of this room uh, that I'm sat in all day. But I, I'm encouraged, I guess, by by many of the posts that have happened because I think that's the that's the step one to accountability. Um, and I tell people all the time, like if your company posted Black Lives Matter, well, then I'm going to come back to you now and say, well, no, you publicly said that you agree with the statement, that you support it, that you believe in it. So now we have an avenue to start talking about all of the things 
um, that you could look at differently or be doing better or stop doing altogether to live up to what you have just announced is your intention and your deepest value. So I think it's I think it's been good from that point of view. From other points of view, though, we we've, we've seen brands that have tweeted and really do have problematic things happening within their own four walls. And, you know, what are you going to do? Reply to the tweets and call them out and then hope they answer you. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Um, So I think, you know, the level of transparency that we have always been asking for still feels very difficult to achieve, especially to achieve alone and remotely. But the thing that I think could be a pretty powerful antidote to that and something that I'm really excited about are the number of black employees that we see speaking out like I at least have never seen before. Um, There have been many things I've experienced at work and, you know, you keep it to yourself or you know that people will minimize it or you just don't want to be a complainer or whatever it is. But the good that I think has come out of this moment for me personally is seeing people at the New York Times, hearing their journalists say that their newsroom is really racist and calling out their own paper in their own paper um, and having to reckon with that. So I think that's been really encouraging from my perspective. Uh, Fantastic to hear. And, And Jerry, can you talk to us a little bit about the WFA's diversity and inclusion task force but um, before you do i mean one of the things i'd read in an article of yours that i loved was this notion of covering up and that you know you mm-hmm. personally have been able to make the choice uh, and very compelling story to listen to when you first met some new colleagues what did you do at the weekend and you had that moment when you thought do i don't i and actually you were brave enough to say well i spent it with my boyfriend and actually from yeah. that moment because you brought your whole self to work you felt great so Love reading that. Love what you're doing. Can can we hear more about it? Yeah, I think there, there are definitely kind of two sides to diversity. I mean, there are many sides to it, but one of them is kind of the internal, one of them is the external. I think the, the internal one, that, that's a real passion point of mine. I think nearly all of us are kind of covering something up in the office. I mean, yeah, for me, it's, you know, I'm, I'm a gay man, so I make decisions a lot of the time when I talk to colleagues, when I talk about what I've been doing, whether I choose to share or not. And, and usually I do actively choose to share because I think it, it makes a, a big difference to other colleagues. I, even, it was even more true when, when I was in the office. I used to think one of the most powerful things like a you know a straight white man can do in the office is sort of stand up and loudly leave at three o'clock and say, I'm going to pick the kids up because it kind of, you know, it really just endorses the fact that that's fine and that's okay and that no one questions that you're still going to do your job. You're just, you're working around that. So whether it's sexuality, race, religion, you know, family, there's many different responsibilities we all have and some of those we feel we should try and cover up. But I think it just, it makes us worse at work if you're continually checking yourself. Um, you know, we, we think about like the challenge of diversity and inclusion, but me and Belinda love to talk about it as an opportunity as well. And you don't you don't maximize that opportunity unless you're allowing people to be themselves in the work. It's no long no use kind of tick boxing. Yeah, we've got you know ethnic representation and age representation and um, sexuality representation, all sorts. If we then force everyone to try and be the same person, so I think that, yeah, that's a really important thing for me personally. And I think it's something you kind of have to be even more deliberate about in this sort of <laughs> Zoom world because you know there are fewer of those casual moments. But yeah, on, on a on a bigger picture. Um, it's it wasn't caused by the events of this year, but it has happened rather timely. Uh, is that yeah, the WFA has launched this new diversity and inclusion and representation task force. It was always supposed to be launching this year, in, in theory, in, in person at the WFA's event in Singapore, and now much more virtually than that. And it's it's a group of about twenty or so marketers from across WFA members. Um, great to have people from from around the world and a, and a wide selection of those those companies, really senior marketers. And, and the first thing I'd say is that senior marketers do care about this and they will give their time as long as they think change is happening. And as soon as they think it's just talking and nothing's changing, they'll, they'll go and find something else. And that's what we're trying to focus on. Um, not reinventing the wheel, but trying to start by looking what's out there. How can we curate what's out there? How can we collaborate with other organizations like the Unstereotype Alliance, like the great work that P&G, Unilever, Diageo, lots of these companies are already doing, like the great work that local associations like here in the UK or over in the US are doing. How do we 
pull a lot of that together and start moving that around um, and then also how do we kind of keep challenging and pushing for where we need to do more and Belinda and I have sort of loosely divided between I'm focusing a bit more on the external uh, content and marketing we're producing and, and Belinda a bit more internally and I think you know that that external bit is a, is a huge responsibility that marketers have you know we we have billions trillions of contacts with consumers um, and you know there's there's a spectrum of what you can do in that space through you know you can be super super purposeful and telling really powerful stories um, but frankly we can all we can all do something because historically marketing has been quite guilty of stereotypes of you know women in the kitchen doing the laundry and um, you know many worse stereotypes from different audiences so it starts by just positively representing uh, the diversity of our consumers, uh, and then we, we take it from there. I want to push you into talk about intersectionality a little bit. So I represent a different problem, and it's the one that's the colour of my hair. I mean, I was interested to see, you know, the trouble that Mark Reed got himself into when he talked about, you know, the generation that worked for WPP that didn't work in the ACES. Um, and I grew up in the ACES, working in the ACES. So ageism, cognitive diversity, you know, are you seeing those as important themes as well? I mean, absolutely. I think, you know, ageism is a challenge in the industry, both internally in how we do kind of really, really sort of chase after the youth and this idea that, you know, compared to other industries, we seem to have a view that, you know, age doesn't bring experience, it brings you outdated. And of course, part of our industry have changed, but actually that, that age and that responsibility is is creating that and also externally that like, marketers love to sort of fixate on talking to sort of young audiences being on TikTok, doing the latest cool thing but you know a lot of our consumers are you know older people and, and also how we present older people like we have brands that talk to the kind of the you know the over 50s and you know i've worked to have historically sometimes lent into showing those people like, at home not leaving the house hardly doing anything you know we're all getting quite close to that ourselves and you know it's you know you can be 50 and super active you can be 60 you can be 70 and super active these days so how do we positively represent those people um it's, it's a matter of way. and the intersectionality is is huge like you know nobody is just one thing you're many different things shape you um and i think you know yes it's great to look at gender and look at sexuality and look at race but ultimately we have to, to bring it all together and just reflect uh, society and, and, and what kind of toolkit have we got at the WFA that's helping people to do this, Belinda? I mean, I know you've been thinking about that and, and how to have an impact. Yeah, I mean, one of the things when we uh, were thinking about uh, Singapore still happening this year, uh, uh, we really wonderful guide around inclusion and diversity that we were going to release at that event. And that was also going to kick off this task force. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really from the perspective of brands who are doing well, as Jerry said, in their external touch points. So in the products that they have and the services that they offer and their marketing and communications, as well as brands that are doing well internally and what that looks like in caring for your employees and really trying to sow that ethos through your entire company and not just have it show up in one pillar or one team or one touch point, which we think is the big unlock. It's the most important. From my perspective, one of the most important parts of that task force are us having really honest and uncomfortable conversations. And we brought that group together and most of them are, are big brand marketers, but we have agencies and, and partner associations as well because we intentionally wanted to invite the thought leaders in this space, the best in breed in this space to come together and be able to mess up with each other and be able to ask questions that feel a little awkward and be able to get perspectives from other people who are really trying to do this work all throughout their organization. And I think that's a big piece of it. And, and things in intersectionality, of course, comes up in all of that as well. We talk about religion in that group and prayer breaks and prayer rooms. We talk about all sorts of things. Um, I think the thing you know, that's unique about this moment is this is the first time, at least in my career, that I've seen the industry really be comfortable with saying the word black. 
And, and that's monumental for me because I, I you know, you, you feel like you're not in the room because people feel afraid to, to call you by name or to say what you are. And so I think, you know, we do want to talk about intersectionality, but it's also a really important moment to acknowledge that there are some uncomfortable pieces of the conversation that we haven't been willing to have yet. And I think as a WFA team, we're going to facilitate that and create a safe space where as an industry, we can talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we did in my previous company, now the NatWest Group, was had reverse mentorship. So, for instance, I, mm -hmm. for the BAME community, I, by the way, I'm very uncomfortable with that notion of calling it the BAME community because that bundles everybody up. We can come on to that. Yeah. And actually, that, one of the things I talked about is I didn't know what to say because, you know, when I lived in Atlanta back in the early 90s and saw the language of political correctness but not the behavior to go with it, you know, you would have been an African-American and I couldn't possibly have said you were black. Which, so, you know, you can't, that traveled back here. Weird, actually. Jerry, have you seen an acceleration as well of things happening? Yeah, I, I definitely think there's, there's been a catalyst. I think the sort of Black Lives Matter movement stuck stuck at home. It it's really has raised it up the top of people's agenda. I think, as Linda hinted at, we're yet to truly see how much change is, is driven. There's been a lot of talk, a lot of discussion. I think that's a, the first step. And, and some of this stuff does take time. Like, I think you have to give companies time. I know, I know my own company, we are, we're having very serious, meaningful conversations and taking real action. And, and some of that stuff takes months and even longer to manifest externally. But certainly that the pressure will be on to see that. And I think that idea of reverse mentorship or hearing from another side is is really important. I've actually been doing a the Bloom Exchange, which is a UK thing where I'm swapping with lovely Fiona, who's a, a, la a lovely lady who works in advertising, and just sharing our kind of, from a gender perspective, what, what are some of the things you, you don't see on the other side of the door? And it's kind of crazily eye-opening for me. I mean, I, I'm conscious of diversity. I, I feel like I'm someone who's, you know, fairly aware of it. And, and still, I, I understood about 10% or 20% of kind of the just the daily challenges, struggles, conversational moments, bias that, that she sees and, and faces in what, in what she does and, and, and women more generally. But I think it's really powerful to just try and uh, put yourselves in other people's shoes. And it's, you know, you don't always have to do it one on one. There have been so many talks, so many panels, so many articles written that spend a bit of time educating yourself, reading some of that stuff. Um, there's, a, there's a lot out there now. So not a lot of excuse not to educate yourself. One of the things I've seen people talk about is that what the virus has caused is an acceleration of trends that were already there. Um, I haven't yeah. seen anybody talking about the acceleration of a trend that was already there, which is diversity and inclusion. Can you can you perhaps touch on that and talk about the four C's that the WFA worked to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a really great call out. Um, so the, the four C's that we built the diversity task force around were about convening, again, best in the industry thought leaders, people we can learn from, curating those insights and making them accessible to a wider community. I mean, we're not precious about what we're doing. We want to figure out what works and then we want to figure out how to to spread that, um, us serving as a catalyst. So us trying to um, interject this consideration into the discussions we're having, because honestly, just like digital transformation, everything we talk about comes down to your people. And you can't talk about people without talking about your people feeling included and that they belong and that you have an accurate representation of people. And the last thing, uh, this is probably my favorite and Jerry's very good at this on Twitter as well, which is challenge. So, you know, which is to say like, you know, whatever the term is like, say black person, say African-American, like let's just get to the heart of the issue. And we're not gonna get it all right, but we're here with good intentions and we're here with mutual respect. And we really are trying to challenge um, people to go further. And to, to kind of wrap that up, what I think go further means for me is to be um, transparent and be very clear and make a commitment. And, and that's how you make sure that we continue progress in this area. And Jerry, can I go back to that great article of yours? Because there was a statistic in there that terrified me, which is 
Stonewall research that showed that 62% of graduates, when they're applying for a job and they're trying to get in the world of work, they go back in the closet. I mean, it, what do you see happening to help people be themselves at point of entry to work, which strikes me as a real place that change is needed? Yeah, it's, it's a, a, a surprising stat, and especially because it, it does consistently apply within marketing, because we think of ourselves as quite a progressive industry. I mean, without being certainly certainly compared to some sort of you know, manufacturer or something like that, which is, 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 a, is a tougher environment even more, I would imagine. Um, we see ourselves quite progressive and often you wouldn't see tangibly, like unless you start looking for it, you often don't imagine, you know, we're very accepting, we're very welcoming. Why, why would someone not be able to be themselves at the office? But you don't have to dig too far, LGBT, race, all sorts of other issues to find out that we're not quite as accepting as we'd like to be. But there's there's a lot that you can you can do in that space. I think um, I've worked at some great companies where they have what they call ERGs or employee resource groups, so the Rainbow Network or Spectrum or just really yeah. visible organisations that uh, are where you're with L L LGBT people or, or other ER ERGs exist for other segments of the population. Um, and I think that's really powerful just to, to, to find like-minded people, to make friends quickly in the company, to, to, to know those fact those organisations exist. I mean, we've had some great... Um, it was kind of a, a coming out day um, quite recently, and we had some great um, stories sold and sh shared on our intranet at work. Just some of our senior leaders, some of whom I didn't honestly know were LGBT, but talking about their stories and just modelling that. And yeah, because on the back of that article, I had quite a few people email me be, being telling their own sort of little stories of like when they first joined an agency or when they first worked on a new client, but they were nervous to say anything and they didn't want to bring it up and often there's a moment when somebody else in the room often someone more senior um you know says something is honest about themselves reveals some part of who they are and what they're going through and it doesn't have to be the same thing it can be some other kind of moment of authenticity and vulnerability that that i think really helps and that kind of models the behavior we want to see in our industry um as well as a lot of efforts we need to get a more diverse group of people to want to come into the industry in the first place yeah, I mean, for me, that's a, you know, you know, those companies that have values on the wall, um, that it's only when the values are lived and delivered that you actually see real change. And actually, I love, you know, the, again, the NatWest group, one of the values was the job of a leader is to allow everybody to be themselves and bring their whole self to work. Because as Oscar Wilde wonderfully said, you know, I have to be myself because everybody else is taken. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> one of the things I've always thought about advertising is it's like cultural wallpaper and it needs to reflect what's in the culture. And I don't see many ads that reflect that. I think, you know, if you are, are part of the demographic that sees yourself reflected everywhere, I don't even think it occurs to you to understand that there are huge pieces of experiences and cultures and populations that are completely erased. Um, and I think we have to do a better job, not only of reflecting that in our advertising, I agree, but we have to remember that we pay for almost all of the content that gets produced. So maybe, you know, a movie isn't an advertisement, but some partnership with the studio or with the entertainment group is funding all of that. And we have the ability to help influence everything that gets brought into the world, as well as a duty to make sure that our content um, rings true as well. Advertisers do fund, in particular the internet and certainly a lot of content. I think it's, it's a really key point. And you can approach that in, in two ways. One, it's just like looking just casually where your media is, is, is flowing you know, making sure you're not funding the bad stuff, but increasingly, like, deliberately make sure you're funding the good stuff. Are you funding journalism, high quality entertainment, diverse voices, you know, often diverse voices, you know, minority publications help you reach a really engaged audience. And they only need relatively small amounts of media money to exist. So uh, that's a massive opportunity for us. And at a bigger level of TV networks, yeah, movie studios, we, we do have influence. And if we push and we say like, we want to appear alongside more black produced content, content gets made. And it's and part of the nervousness, and I, I remember there's a story that um, Channel 4 here in the UK tell when they first commissioned Queer as Folk, which was a very progressive LGBT piece of content uh, 20 years ago or something. One of the real issues was that they couldn't get advertisers to appear alongside it. And, and it's only because they have a really strong mantra as a diversity-focused channel that they, they pulled it off. And yes, they found some advertisers who would stick with it. 
But let's not be those advertisers. Let's be the advertisers who actively say, create more, create more interesting, diverse content. And the great thing is that lots of eyeballs like to watch it as well. So it's kind of win-win. Well, I also think it says a lot about your brand when you do that. But can I say, both of you, first of all, how lovely to see you. And I can't wait to see you again in person. Let's hope it's Singapore next year, but who knows? Um, so a couple of questions to end with. The first one is, what do you think should be top of any CMO's priority list at the moment? Let me start with you, Belinda. I think any CMO at this moment really people should be number one at the top of your list. Clearly, I think diversity is a huge piece of that. But I, I also want to say, um, just like digital transformation, you can't get there without spending money on it. This yeah. is an area where you need to hire experts. You need to bring someone in from the outside who understands this area and can help you walk this path. Fantastic. Thank you. And you, Jerry? Yeah, I, I'll cheat and piggyback on something that's already on top of most CMOs agendas, which is growth and say, you know, all CMOs want growth. But uh, wouldn't it be great if you could suddenly find a whole wider range of audiences who you could better persuade to suddenly buy your brand? And as it happens, better diversity, better inclusion, better representation in your marketing is, is kind of a, a magic trick in the box that not many brands have pulled uh, to do that. Now, of course, people buy from brands that don't reflect them in their advertising, but they're even more likely to buy from the ones that do. Um, and I think everything Belinda said about people is absolutely right, because the best way of driving that external change is to fix the pipes internally as well. But yeah, if you want to if you want to grow your business, if you want to grow your marketing efforts, then make your marketing better reflect the audiences you'd like to be buying. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think it's it's a complete mind shift, and um, I just I think we it, we really have to have the stomach for it because it is a deeply uncomfortable conversation. I was just um, I've been doing a little consulting with some agencies and in, in another company on diversity and I had a board meeting last week and they said, you know, that's it. We've got to do much better. We're going to have targets. We have to hire for diversity across the board, but we won't still want the best candidate for the job. We always want the best person. We always want the most qualified. So we're going to do every single thing we can do. We want women. We want black people. We want people of color, BAME, you know, but you know, we'll never sacrifice. We want the most qualified person. And um, I said to them, you know, you don't have the best qualified people right now, right? And I think I was able to say that because I don't work there, because I can't imagine how uncomfortable it would be to have to say that to your boss or your chairman. And, um, and everyone was kind of quiet. And I said, you know, we just talked about one of your offices that operates somewhere where the population of that office, like of the town, is 40% white, but your office in that town is 85% white. It's a mathematical impossibility that you've only chosen the very best people for the job and you've over-indexed on one group in that way. So the people you have now aren't the best people. And so I think it's just, it's a really difficult mental and perspective challenge. At GSK, one thing we've, we've looked at is not just the end result targets, but some of the targets that get you there. So for instance, in the LGBT space, our target is not X percentage of employees are LGBT. It's get a high ranking in the Stonewall Index, which is an index that shows we have inclusive policies, that we are a welcoming place. And then hopefully, yeah. you know, LGBT people will, and it was one of the reasons I chose to work there, because I, I thought it was a, a really strong organizational community kind of backbone so it's not always just putting a percentage target on it's it's you know it, it can be silly things like the target on in the interview process how you make sure you at least have the right people through the door but you know it's not it's not simple to put targets but targets do drive change that's right also, the, these two comments are a great demonstration of the the power of culture in a company and actually you know, that business of when you're on the outside, you can say whatever you think. And when you're on the inside, you've got to fit into the culture. And if the culture is the wrong yeah. one, that's not good. So, you know, God bless insultants is what I would say about that. <laughs> to hear that. All right. Well, listen, thank you again both very much. And you know, for all of you watching, I hope you've enjoyed this. And wherever you are, you know, I'm sitting in London and it's um, time for the sequel known as Tier 2. That's after lockdown. 
Um, stay safe, take care, and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.